share the screen. Sorry. Share my screen. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, um, Professor Johnston, um, Professor Wyro, who's here as well. Um, we're really excited. PSSA is really excited to present this year at the open house and get to know students and answer any questions that um, prospective majors and concentrators may have, um, as well as just give an overview of the major. Um, so who are we? The Political Science Student Association. We're a nonpartisan student organization. Um, we have events with professors, scholars, and students. We recently held an event this Tuesday with Professor Oliver McClellan, who many know for teaching Intro to American Politics in the past few years which is a really awesome event about public opinion in the upcoming midterm elections. Um, so if you'd like to join our PSSA mailing list to get information about generally Columbia political science or about our events, um, there's a link right there, or you can follow us on social media. Uh, hi, um, I'm Ryan, I'm a junior, and I'm just gonna help give a quick overview of the majors uh, that are part of political science department. Um, so first, um, as a part of the political science department, you have uh, four main subfields. You have American politics, international relations, comparative politics, political theory. Um, as a part of your major, you will choose a primary and a secondary subfield. Um, and we also have joint majors, which we'll talk about um, a bit later. Um, I guess we'll move on. Um, as a part of the major, you'll take a total of nine courses. Um, you take two intro classes, um, and those can be from the four, the four subfields. Um, so once you choose your primary, you'll take three classes um, as a part of that subfield, and that can also include that intro class. So if you took, let's say, in my case, I was um, American politics primary subfield, um, I had, you know, that intro to American politics, would, which would then count for my, um, my three classes. So then you can also do two classes in your sub secondary subfield. Um, and once again, that can include your intro class if you took inter international politics as a part of your secondary subfield. Uh, inter international relations, that can also count. You also then have uh, two seminars which are required for the major, um, and it's one in your primary, and then the other one can be from either of the other three. You have one elective, which can be from any subfield, and then you have one research methods course, which can be from a variety of classes that are offered and all listed on um, the department website. Um, so as the concentration, um, it's a bit, uh, different. You only have to take seven total courses. Um, you have two intro classes in the primary and secondary subfield. And rather than um, three classes for your primary, you're only taking two. And once again, this can include your intro class. Um, and similarly to the major, you'll take two classes for your secondary subfield. Um, and instead of one elective, like in the major, you'll take two actually. Um, and you still have the research methods um, requirement. Um, and you do not have the seminar requirement that you have with the major. Hi, I'm Tomas. I'm a junior as well. Um, apologies, I'm having some camera difficulties, so that's why that's not on. Um, but in addition to just the uh, political science major and concentration, we have some joint majors as well. And um, this first one is a joint major of political science and statistics. Um, it's similar to concentrating in both uh, poli sci and statistics. So it's not a double major, it's just uh, the one combined track. And the requirements for, for this are three courses in the primary subfield, um, which can include your intro course, so whichever that might be. Uh, you also need to take a seminar, two research methods course, and then for the statistics side, you need to take statistics sequences A or B, as well as the statistics elective. And um, there's no double counting courses in, the, in this track. We also have a political science economics joint major. Um, for this one, you need to take a minimum of 17 courses, uh, and of those 17, you need to take five core economics, three mathematics, and as well as two economics electives, and two uh, subfields. And for those subfields, you need to take three courses in the primary subfield, two in the secondary, as well as two poli sci seminars. And for this one, unlike the other one, you can double count uh, one course. Awesome, so I thought I'd put on the screen like a sample student plan of study um, that has the primary subfield being American politics and the secondary subfield being comparative um, 
politics of American and comparative, um, just showing students that um, the major can really um, take up your four years. Um, you can take a class one, one class a semester, two classes a semester. Um, but usually students will take seminars um, later in their career, uh, later in their career, um, on, in their, uh, later in their undergraduate career, which is nice. Um, so that's just a, a sample student plan of study. And here's just some miscellaneous information um, about the major. Um, one thing is graduate courses. Um, if you look on the directory, sometimes you will see graduate courses. Um, and that you will pretty much need permission from the instructor of the course who's taking, teaching the graduate course and the director of undergraduate studies to enroll in that class. Um, another really helpful thing for majors is the course number key on the website. This is especially for classes where students may be unsure what subfield the class falls under. And it's really simple. You go on the department website and it'll have a number key um, and each number will correspond to a subfield. So you know um, really easily which courses count for which subfields. There's also a BA and MA, pro, like a BA MA program um, for juniors going into the senior year, which can be really beneficial um, for those wanting to get a master's. Um, so definitely look out for that if you are uh, finishing up your sophomore year or um, if you're interested in something like that. There's also a political science honor society named Pi Sigma Alpha Mu Chapter. It's for juniors and seniors. Um, there's a GPA requirement to join. So um, flyers about that will go out every semester or so. And it's a great opportunity to get involved um, both at political science here at Columbia and, and nationally. And last, um, one of the best ways to capstone your experience in Columbia political science is through an honors thesis seminar, um, which you have to apply to in um, your junior year and you take the course, which is a year long course in your senior year. Um, for any juniors on the call on the Zoom, application is out now um, and it'll be due March 31st at 11.59 p.m. So I really encourage you to look into writing a senior thesis. Um, it's really a great capstone to um, a great Columbia political science career. And so the last slide we have are advising. You should definitely take advantage of advising, which is great here at Columbia. Um, PhD students advise and they help you with course planning requirements and can go through your plan of study forms, as well as kind of helping students through internships, research interests, and post-college plans. So if you have any questions about the major or anything political science here, you can email poli-sci-advising at columbia.edu. And um, Professor Johnston, um, I just thought I'd note, is the Director of Undergraduate Studies as well. Um, so I'll pass it over to Professor Warrow. Um, I should stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we're going to, uh, Professor Johnston and I are gonna tag team to talk a little bit about substantively what goes on in the different subfields um, and what is potentially unique about political science at, at Columbia. Um, so I'll start off with my uh, area of specialization, which is American politics. Um, and basically this subfield concerns the study of American institutions and, and, and political behavior. Um, it's one of the largest subfields, not just at Columbia, but, but uh, all over the, the world in terms of faculty and, and enrollments. Um, and it's been responsible for generating many substantive and methodological innovations in, in the discipline. Um, so, you know, I said that the subfield is divided between, uh, for the most part, you know, it's divided between those who study institutions and those who study political behavior. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit more about what we mean by that. So by institutions, we mean uh, those who study uh, Congress or the courts, the judiciary, um, the um, a bureaucracy and the oversight of, of regulatory agencies. Um, but institutions also extend to things like uh, like electoral rules. Uh, for example, um, how do how are primaries run um, and what what uh, impact do they have on questions of things like political polarization? Um, so when we talk about political behavior, um, we're talking about things like uh, like public opinion and um, and how it relates to, to public policy. Um, we talk about things like um, uh, voting and, and political psychology. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, one of the things that our department is, is especially known for is the leading scholars that we have in the, in the study, um, study of elections. Um, in the behavioral line, we also study questions of, 
of politics of race and, and racial identity. And we have faculty who cover who, who cover that. Um, that said, even though you know we have this sort of standard division between uh, institutional research and political behavior research, um, we have a number of faculty who cross back and forth between th those lines, and the lines are pretty blurred actually in in in, uh, in our department, um, which I think. Um, is beneficial for uh, for students who want to think in innovative ways about how American politics works. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Johnston to talk about political theory. OK, thanks, Greg. Um, so I uh, just want to give you a sense of the flavor of political theory for anybody who's, um, you know, especially for those of you who are not really not familiar with all these subfields. That's what we're trying to give you thumbnail sketches of the four primary subfields. Um, uh, John Maynard Keynes, nearly a century ago, is the famous intellectual whose work dominated thinking of economic policymakers for quite a long time, for decades and decades in the 20th century, and it's still very influential, um, said, and this is a quote from Keynes nearly a century ago, quote, the ideas of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong are more powerful than is commonly understood." Uh, close quote. But most work in political science focuses on, just as uh, Professor Raro said in American politics, most work in pol political science focuses on institutions and or behavior. Um, you know, often with some mix of those things and including the behavior of institutions as well as the behavior of individuals depending on what sort of political science you're looking at. Political theory or political philosophy, I'll just use the terms interchangeably, uh, political philosophy focuses on ideas. So although people may talk about institutions and behavior, the focus is really on ideas. So political theorists ask questions about the origins of ideas. Uh, they have questions about the ways in which sets of ideas are connected to one another and coherent with one another or not coherent with one another. Uh, they raise questions about how cogent these ideas are and how useful ideas are. Uh, and they also raise questions systematically about the impact and consequences of ideas. And the ideas, just to give you some examples, the ideas I have in mind include imaginative constructs, as I like to call them such as the ideas of democracy, uh, the idea of race, the idea of rights, the idea of gender, the idea of progress, and many, many others. You could go on and on. You could go on for days, I suppose. Um, but all of these ideas are social constructs. They're all complex and they're all contestable. Uh, exactly what they mean, what they should mean, how they should be defined, whether they're really useful at all, whether they're social constructs that we should get rid of uh, as, or, or we'd be better off without, such as, for example, race, perhaps. Um, maybe progress, some would say. Um, so we in political theory tend to be sympathetic toward Keynes's belief that the ideas political philosophers consider play a decisive and formative role in political, social, and economic life. Uh, we employ two main styles. Um, uh, in this department in particular, we are very strong in two main styles. In, one style is interpretive and the other is analytical. And of course we use combinations of these styles, but these are the two, I would say these are two really primary styles of work in political theory generally and certainly in our department. We have people who are very good at both and we also have people who are very good at one uh, or the other. And collectively, we were very strong in both of these styles. Substantively, we divide up our field uh, among in, in several ways. We, we, of course, offer a lot of work on the history of political ideas or political thought. Um, most of you probably know that. We offer work courses and things like that on things about on ideas about constitutionalism, democracy, about justice rights and so forth. So we have a number of lots of substantive topics we look into um, either interpretatively or analytically or both. Um, 
Sometimes we construct new ideas. This is the most challenging work in political theory or political philosophy uh, to construct really new ideas and new theories, uh, whether they be theories of democracy, theories of justice, theories of, or, some, or something else. Um, we construct new ideas, sometimes with the aim of understanding the world better, and sometimes with the aim also of finding solutions to political and social problems. Um, and occasionally, an idea actually pays off. Um, and has a real constructive impact. Uh, it's not easy to do and not common, but it happens. So I'll just say the political theory faculty at Columbia includes people who specialize in every major area of political theory. Uh, Full-time faculty are all internationally recognized leaders in their specializations. It's a very, very strong faculty. Um, so I'll, I'll quit that one for now. I'll be happy to respond to any specific questions if there's a Q&A, but um, I'll, I'll pass back to Professor Waro. Okay, so this, the second second subfield I wanted to talk about is is comparative politics. I, I talked about the subfield of American politics, and basically, this subfield is generally conceived as the study of politics outside of the United States. Um, even though there are many who believe that the United States is in the world and should be studied alongside with other other countries. Um, so, you know, the the distinction between uh, studying countries outside the United States and studying the United States becoming less relevant in a, in a globalized world. Um, and there are many opportunities for intellectual arbitrage between the uh, what goes on in American politics and what goes on in, in comparative politics. Um, uh, I will also say that the, the line between comparative politics and international relations, which Professor Johnston will talk about um, in, in a bit, is also increasingly blurred. Um, so, um, Comparative politics has, you know, you know a broad geographic scope, um, and it also covers a remarkably diverse range of research questions. So, research questions like um, why are some countries but not others democratic? Um, what accounts for variation in, in welfare policies uh, across countries and and over time? Um, how do political institutions uh, shape uh, economic development and and prosperity? Um, and uh, questions like, under what conditions do ethnic relations become politically relevant? Um, so scholars in comparative politics use uh, a broad range of methods to address these questions. So everything from field experiments to ethnographies to um, observational quantitative and qualitative analysis um, to, to, to study these questions. Um, at Columbia, we seek to have um, a, a pretty broad range of, of topics, even though we're, we're a relatively small faculty com compared to other uh, peer institutions. Um, but our faculty here do have deep substantive knowledge of particular regions and, and countries. Um, so our department is, is particularly well known for work in uh, subjects of, uh, such as comparative political economy, um, economic development and, and democratization, and specifically in um, politics of certain regions like Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, um, East Asia, and, uh, and, and Eurasia. Um, I'll note that we are actively recruiting a new colleague who works on Eastern Europe, uh, which for as reasons I'm sure you're, you're well aware, promises to dominate discussions of world politics for the, uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's a thumbnail sketch of what comparative politics at Columbia is like, and I'll, I'll turn it back to Professor Johnson. So I'll, have a few, I'll say a few things about international relations. Um, I will just uh, reveal following what Professor Raro just said that one of the reasons that Professor Raro and I were talking about not only our specialist subfields, American and political theory, for the two of us, but we're talking about comparative and IR is because basically our, our, our comparative and IR faculty are pretty consumed by the war in Ukraine right now. And their attention is, you know, Many of them, their attention is really focused on that right now. And uh, so we didn't tap them to do this uh, while they're very busy keeping their eyes glued to that. Um, but uh, so let me say a little bit about IR. So the international relations subfield focuses on questions about war and peace, um, questions about the birth, vitality, and boundaries of states. Um, by boundaries, I mean both territorial boundaries. Those, of course, as you no doubt all know, are 
being contested right now in Ukraine uh, have been contested recently in 2004 and 2014, sorry, when Russia annexed Crimea um, and are contested now, but also, uh, also our specialists focus on human boundaries. That is to say, you know, migration and boundaries between human movements and, and things of that sort. Um, they also sometimes, uh, you know, deal uh, or focus on or look at the death of states in the international state system. States do die from time to time. Uh, Ukraine is Ukraine is uh, in some danger of dying. We don't know what will happen, of course. Uh, another field that IR people focused on is the economic and other consequences of international cooperation, um, and sometimes of the absence or limitations of, of or limitations to cooperation. So those are some of the you know, broad questions that IR people look at. Um, some main substantive areas of inquiry to be a little bit more, to divide it up a little bit more the way people typically do it. Um, main substantive fields of inquiry include bargaining and diplomacy among states. Um, they include the organization and tools of military power. Uh, sometimes this is reduced to uh, the short uh, symbolic name bombs and rockets. Um, it's not just about bombs and rockets, but the organization of military power generally. Um, another substantive area of inquiry is international organizations. Uh, the, you know, the most best known one, of course, is the United Nations. Um, but there, there are treaty organizations like NATO. Um, there are other treaty organizations that are primarily military and defense in focus. And then there are or international organizations such as the World Trade Organization which has a different kind of focus. Um, there is also a substantial presence of international relations scholarship in international law. And finally, international political economy is a major field of, within international relations. Um, our faculty overall employ a variety of quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, quantitative methods include both game theoretic methods or game theoretic analyses and statistical methods. Uh, these are two very different kinds of, of quantitative methods. We both, we love them under quantitative. They both are quantitative, but they're very different types of methods. And IR scholars in our department uh, employ both these types. Uh, qualitative methods include things like the interpretation of statements and texts and sources of intelligence, um, historical methods, which people also use, and others of that, of that sort. Uh, scholars in IR are often thought to fall into one of a few schools of thought. I'm going to mention two primary schools of thought. There are some others, but I'll just call attention to two of them. Uh, one of the principal schools of thought is conventionally called realist. So realists, as they're usually thought of, tend to view states as if they were self-interested actors that are motivated to maximize their power within the international system. And, and realist analyses tend to basically rest on the premise that states are more or less as I've just described. Another school of thought is sometimes called liberal internationalism. Uh, liberal internationalists tend to focus on the potential for enduring and peaceful international relationships through trade and other ties. Uh, they will focus on international laws and their peacekeeping potential, uh, their, their potential for maintaining cooperative relations and peaceful relations among states. Uh, they focus on international norms, such as the norms represented by the ideas of human rights, for example, um, and so forth. So liberal internationalists tend to, um, you know, tend to tend to view other things in the international system as important, importantly, you know, importantly impacting what happens in the international system, other than the self-interest of states, as, as it's usually thought of. Um, so these are two of the principal schools of thought in IR. Uh, there are others. Uh, these two are probably the dominant ones. And these schools of thought are pretty richly represented on our faculty. Um, I'll just say the IR faculty group has a, has a, as a, as a as almost sort of said, as said, you know, has a very substantial range of, of methods that they employ. We have people who are expert at all methods, all the major methods of study in political science. We have people who are closer uh, to one school of thought or another, and we have people who study just about the full range of substantive fields of inquiry. That's part of what we try to maintain as a department, 
strengthen all those areas. And we, we succeeded doing that. So um, I think that concludes what uh, we have to say on the subfields. <laughs>